say good morning, didn't I? Yes. Yeah. Right. God bless you. Good morning. We're going to turn your Bibles to the book of James. You're going to need your Bibles for that. Turn your book, turn your Bibles to the book of James. <clears throat> Book of James, we're going to start right there in the first chapter. You may be seated. We'll, we'll, we'll hit that scripture in a second. Book of James, first chapter. God desires a heart that is available to him at the appointed place and at the appointed time to hear his orders. He desires a heart full of true worship. The whole mind and affection is to be set on Christ, on him. All my goals are directed towards him, my all in all. So, are you available to him? Are you a worshiper? Is your intent and purpose in life focused on the person of Jesus Christ? Is it? Having those attitudes means being controlled by the Holy Ghost, who is the only one who can cause you to call Jesus Lord. All your possessions, your time, your energy, your talent, gifts, are under his control. That means being centered on the word, because the word is where Christ is seen. You gaze at his glory in the pages of scripture. As Christ came into the world to give his life, to bring people to himself, so must you. James and Jesus' other half-brothers, his family, were afraid. They didn't know what to think of Jesus. They thought Jesus was crazy. They even mocked him. They said of him, he is beside himself. He's lost it. Early after the start of his public ministry, they sought to take custody of him because they were afraid that he had lost his mind. But later, we're reading in the New Testament these two books called James and Jude. Seems like they've had a change of heart. We've changed our minds, they said. Let us tell you about our big brother Jesus. History tells us that James made such a bold and strong commitment to his half-brother Jesus, their Lord and Savior, that he was taken to the top of the pinnacle of the temple and thrown 150 feet to his death to the temple grounds because he wouldn't stop preaching. Funny thing happened, though. He didn't die. He kept right on preaching. The only way they could shut him up was to club him to death. In reading the epistle of James, it doesn't take long. He start calling people out in his letter. He pulls no punches. He goes right after you, calling those who are living a double life a fake Christian, a walking contradiction. He calls them out as having a dead faith. The primary analogy in scripture is that we go from being dead to being alive. Spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. Amen. I believe that James' no holds balls approach in his letter to the believers in Jerusalem carries a direct, impactful, and authoritative messaging that so many of us need to hear today. James is like my big brother showing me what's what, telling me what I need to do. He's looking out for me, telling me what to look out for, showing me what real Christian behavior looks like, calling me on my behavior to stop being a phony. I think I never really understood James, his teaching. Because if I had, I, I think I would have asked different questions. Because the essential nature of Christianity 
It's not what we theoretically believe. It's how we live. Amen. 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 Because what you believe is not what you say you believe or what you think you believe, but what you believe is how you live. Praise the Lord. Amen. Chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Amen. Amen. So he defines for us what true religion is. And James is going to lay that out for us. So he says, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. That's a description of the weak, the helpless, the poor, those who are, who are in need of compassion and protection. Yeah. They're lost. And in the second part, he says, we're to be unspotted from the world. Now, what if a person who says they are Christian, who believes in all the orthodox things about Christianity, such as Jesus rose from the dead, he died on the cross, but they can't pass this test here in verse 27. Are they a Christian? Now, we intuitively think, intuitively, of course, that they believe all those things. That's all that matters. If they say they're a Christian, of course they say. But what we're going to do is to sit and attention to that. Because I think that that is what James is drawing us into. And I want us to process what James has to say about that question. So James is talking about what true religion is. And he's given us an example of what true religion does. It loves, it's external, it's towards other people. But he's going to change the wording a little bit and ask, what is genuine faith? And what does the real thing look like? Chapter 2, verse 8. And if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. The royal law is an all or nothing category. But that's really kind of difficult for us because we tend to think of it as a partial category. We say, well, I love people, but I'm a sinner. Sometimes I follow God and sometimes I don't. But following him sometimes is better than nothing. So as long as I've done more stuff, good stuff, I'm okay. I'm a good Christian. When you were little, and your parents said to you, clean up your room and take out the trash. But you only cleaned up your room. That's partial obedience. It's not everything you were supposed to do, but at least it's something, which is better than nothing. Amen. So we can understand that. Hold that point. Stay with me. Verse 9. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. That word respect of persons is partiality. It's favoritism. It's sin. That's a very weighty thing he just said. He's saying that if you break one commandment, one commandment of God, you've broken the whole thing. If I wrote the commandments of God on a glass window, and I asked you, which one of these have you broken? You study it and say, that one. And I point to this 
window and I said, this one, loving your neighbor? And I took a hammer and tapped onto that commandment. And we both jumped back, getting out of the way of the broken glass. That's what James is saying. Break one commandment and you've broken the whole law of God. Amen. Verse 11. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Now, James gives us the example of murder and adultery. Hey, you can't kind of commit murder. And you can't kind of commit adultery. You either killed or you didn't. If you commit adultery, it's not helpful to say, I committed only just a little bit of adultery. Mm -hmm. Murder or adultery, it's an all or nothing. Amen. So what James is saying is the summary of all the things that God is asking us to do is the expression of his love and character towards other people that you and I should be expressing. The law is an all or nothing proposition. There's no room for partial obedience because that's disobedience. Back up a second because he's going to explain this a little differently in verse 2. Look at verse 2. For there is for well, if there come unto the assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, when ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Now, I'm going to pull back just a moment because I don't want you to brush past this. Do you show favoritism? The idea here is that based off someone's appearance, you treat them differently. Whether you respect them or you don't respect them, based on how they look or on how much money they have, where they live, how they dress, the kind of car they drive, what they do for a living, what political viewpoint they have, the color of their skin, their perspective, opinion on things, their education, because they wear a mask or refuse to wear one. Are you judging, treating people differently because they're different, because of the way they look? This can be so subtle, even hidden from us. We've been doing this so long, we don't even realize we're doing it. We don't, we don't even recognize that it's sin. And the Spirit of God, if the Spirit of God hasn't convicted us about this, something's wrong. Amen. Jesus said something worth noting. He said, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. That's why it's so dangerous to judge others. Because what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Scary thought. We want God to show us mercy. So James is showing, contrasting for us, Two attitudes. He's saying some people show mercy 
show honor to some people, but then have none towards others. Why? Breaking this one commandment of God, favoritism, partiality, you're breaking the entire heart of God. Amen. Remember the tax collector and the Pharisee who prayed in the temple? The Pharisee said, God, I'm not perfect, but I'm not like that sinner over there. I'm not like those people. They're all jacked up. I could never do the things they do, the way they live, the way they act. It's insane. Lord, oh Lord. not like them. Jesus taught that this mentality is not right with God. But he pointed out that the man who beat his chest and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He went away justified. If you hate your brother, the Bible says, you're a murderer. And we know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Our beliefs should indicate our behavior. Our beliefs should control the way we act. So now James outlines three types of faith that we're going to look at today. A dead faith, a demonic faith, and the third type of faith, the kind we all want to have, a dynamic. Point number one, a dead faith. James is going to perfectly illustrate that for us in verse 14. So you're going down the street, and you see a man. He's cold, naked, hungry. And you bend down and walk over to him and say, how you doing, bro? Are you cold? Are you hungry? I got something for you. Be blessed. Be filled. God bless you now. See ya. And you get up, walk away. What kind, what kind of compassion do you have? Where's your faith? You know, G James said something about that person. He said, how dwelleth the love of God in you? You must have sprung a leak because you're running on empty. Where's the love of God? Do you know what else James said? He said, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Amen. Not only is it wrong to help that person, to not help that person, it's also sin. So ask yourself this question. Why? Did not help that person. Was it because of the way they looked? Did you suddenly decide that it's more blessed to keep your money? So you decided to substitute words for action. Jesus was asked a question one day by a lawyer, seeking to trap him in his words. The lawyer asked, who's my neighbor? And Jesus answered, a man was traveling, and suddenly, out of nowhere, a band of thieves assaulted him, robbed him, left him for dead. After a time, a priest came by and saw the dying man, but passed by on the crossing over to the other side of the road. Then another man approached. It was a Levi. Surely this godly man would help the helpless. But alas. He stepped right over the man and went his way. It certainly appeared that this poor man, this helpless soul, would end up food for the scavengers. A long time passed, and the light of day was fading. Hope was fading, too. Then this poor man heard a voice. He recognized the accent. It was a Samaritan. And the man thought, Jews, we Jews despise them. We have no dealings with Samaritans. They're half-breeds. A 
But the man was kind, gentle, and didn't seem to mind helping an injured Jew. I'm not getting involved. Somebody will come along. I'm not a paramedic. Somebody to call an ambulance. Yeah. That kind of faith is worthless. Good for nothing. It's like salt that's lost its savor, its saltiness. It's good for only one thing, to be thrown out. It's a dead thing. Now, some folks can fool you. They know the right words. They know all the hymns. Amen. They have the same seat in the sex word for the last 10 years. They tear up during worship. They may even understand and can explain the gospel. But no man can come into contact with Jesus Christ no more than he can come into contact with a 220 volt cable and remain the same and remain unchanged. Amen. If you touch that power source, you're going to be changed. Amen. You're going to be affected. Now, don't let that inner legalist flare up inside of you and you say, well, where's the list? Uh, uh, where's the, stuff, the list of the stuff I got to do to be a Christian? Uh, I'll get it done. I'll even add more works. That's like having a dead tree and taping paper apples on it and say, see, it's alive. The tree's alive. If you saw a tree with no leaves on it, and it was like that year after year, you would safely come to the conclusion that that tree is dead. Amen. And you would be correct. Amen. Because the life is not in the leaves. It's in the root. So what does a dead person do? Do they do anything except decompose, deteriorate? Yeah. What do they do? The life in them is gone. They're incapable of doing anything. But Jesus said, if you believe, you will pass from, from death unto life. Evidence is when you pass from death unto life. When you receive life, you are transformed. Transformation is the evidence. Point number two, demonic faith. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say that thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Devils. Let me be clear. I'm not talking about the exorcist with that girl's head spinning around. That's possession. To some people, it may come as a shock that demons have faith. I believe their theology is better than ours. They've been around for thousands of years and know the Bible. Amen. So, what do demons believe? James tells us. They believe and they tremble. The demons know and believe in the existence of God. They also believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They know he's the son of God. Whenever demons came into contact with Jesus here on earth, they said, we know who thou art, the Holy One of God. Believing and trembling like the demons is not a saving experience. So you say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ. He's the only one of God. So what? Have you submitted your life to the Lord, to his lordship? Are you doing his works? Are you obeying and keeping his commandments? You can be enlightened in your mind, stirred in your heart, tear up during worship, and still be lost forever. True faith involves something more, something that can be seen and recognized. It's a changed life, yeah. a life Amen. that has been impacted by Jesus Christ. Amen. James is saying, 
Where's the proof of your faith? Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith with my works. A lot of people make the mistake of going forward and saying the sinner's prayer, then going away, and then continuing living in the same kind of life, still continuing in the same patterns of sin. They haven't changed. This is what James is calling a demonic faith. This is what he calls the faith that will not save you. But they say, I believe in God. Big deal. Who does it? Except a fool. The Bible says it's a fool that says there's no God. You say you believe in God, it only proves one thing, that you're not a fool. Amen. But it doesn't save you. You can believe and still hate God. The evidence is not what you say, but how you live. Amen. Your actions are not the exception of what you believe. They're the evidence of what you believe. Amen. I read an article a while back which said they're putting warning, level, warning labels on Halloween costumes. They're doing that now. The article mentioned the Superman costume in particular. The label reads this way. Putting this costume on does not enable you to fly. Hmm. Do you know how dangerous that is? If someone were to think that, if someone were to think they're a Christian and wasn't, that's a false hope. Hmm. I ran into a friend who I hadn't seen since our kids were very young. And we swapped stories about our children. He told me about his son, Chris, when he was just three. Chris believed he could swim. He had the false sense of confidence that he could swim, but he couldn't. More than once, at full speed, he would sprint to the pool. Joe said, here we were getting out the car, arms full of groceries, and this kid is dashing for the pool with all his clothes on. And Joe said, okay, I guess I'm going into the pool now. He had to drop the groceries, run and dive in because Chris started sinking. He shook his head. Jackie and I had to constantly watch this boy because he was going swimming and somebody had to go in and get him. So that's a dangerous thing. It's, a, it's so dangerous to believe that you're something that you're not. Mm. Now think about this. What's more dangerous? A little boy who can't swim and is terrified of water or a little boy who can't swim but is fearless of water? The danger of self-deception. Believing that we're saved because, oh, I've been baptized. The devil believes. He goes to church. He reads the Bible. He believes in God. He also hates God. James is saying, there's more to it than that. What? It has to affect the way you live. Amen. It has to affect your character, the way you treat people. A young man just lived a few doors from our house. Knew his family. You all know I preach downtown. Saw him down there. And he's on the corner, you know, with others selling drugs. He looks so out of place. You can see that. And as I'm down there every weekend, when I saw him, I spoke to him. He told me, I'm a Christian. I was raised in the church. And I said, but what you do don't back up what you say. Your life testifies against that. Mm -hmm. Your life outweighs what you say you believe. The two don't line up. I'm just doing what I have to do to make it. I'm just trying to make it, Mr. George. Then years now, I don't see anything. There needs to be 
the appropriate behavior. Amen. Faith goes alongside our works. Amen. James makes it really clear for all those self-deceivers out there. Yeah. Faith without works is, is dead. dead. Church, this is the word of God. It should strike fear into your hearts. It should cause you to honestly reflect and ask, do I have the kind of faith that God has truly given me? Dynamic, saving faith. Or do I have something else? Point number three. James continues now with this third and final kind of faith. This is the faith that we all want. It's the only faith we want. Mm -hmm. It's the only faith that can save a sinful person like me. Amen. Dynamic faith. Mm -hmm. To start with, dynamic faith is always based on the word of God. Praise the Lord. Romans 10, 17 tells us faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Abraham is a good example. God told him, leave your country. And Abraham said to his wife, woman, we're moving. Pack your bags. And Sarah said, where are we going, my dear? I don't know. And Sarah said, yes, dear. And off they went. James says this, this is dynamic saving faith. Abraham heard the Lord yeah. what to do, and then he responded to it. A dynamic faith, it involves the will. It takes the whole person to participate in true saving faith. The mind understands the truth, the heart desires the truth, and the will acts upon the truth. Yeah. Faith leads to action. True saving faith, genuine faith, not counterfeit faith, not dead faith. It's that pure, undefiled religion. True faith, James says, leads, moves, springs the believer into action. So now we're ready to test ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says this. Examine yourself. Test yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. Not somebody else. Not the person sitting next to you. Prove yourself. Examine yourself. Your own self. Know ye not your own selves? Don't you even know? Don't you even recognize that how Jesus Christ is in you except Ye be reprobates, unless you have failed this test. I'll give you another verse. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Amen. What would you do if you were going to a personal trainer in order to lose weight? And after three months, you looked at yourself in the mirror, hey, I don't think I'm losing weight. In fact, I, I think I've gained weight. This is terrible. I'm, what's going on with this? Trade. What would you do? My goal with this message is not to scare you. It's not to discourage you or to put you down. It's just a challenge that I want to extend you. But take this challenge seriously. The theme, as James speaks to the church, is that we would have genuine faith. So examine yourself and ask yourself this question. Do I practice what I say I believe? Do I live out the faith that I say I have? This is not the question that you should ask one time in your whole entire life. No. Do I live out what I know to be true? Do I practice what I preach? We have not saved, our, we are not saved by our good works, but our salvation will produce works. Yeah. 
We are saved by faith alone, faith in Jesus Christ alone. If your faith is not what it ought to be, test it out. If you fail to test, do something about it. If you didn't know me, and I told you that I was married, you would believe me. But when I went home at night, and you saw that I was living by myself, dating random girls, and not committed to any one person, what would you conclude? That I'm not married. Because my life outweighs what I said. This is what James is saying. So if you say, I'm a Christian, but you don't demonstrate that by the way you live, by the things you do, and your life doesn't look very Christian, doesn't match up, what should you conclude? So marriage is one of the pictures that Jesus gives us in the scripture about what a relationship with him is like. Jesus is stunning. Jesus is saying, I'm committed to you for life. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus came and performed all the works in order to have that relationship with you. He did everything it took, including giving his own life on the cross. Amen. To prove that he loves you. And he invites you into a relationship with him. So live out the life that he instructs you to live. Not because you're trying to earn his love. You already have that. But because that is the best life you could possibly live. <coughs> now, if you've already concluded that you don't have saving faith, I have good news for you. Jesus, the Son of God, who is a resurrection and a life, he that believeth in me, he says, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. Jesus is raising people from the dead. The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Amen. He that heareth the voice of the Son of God shall live. Jesus will give your dead faith life. Beloved, God gives grace to the humble. Yes, he does. But he resists the proud. Yeah. Abraham was an idol worshiper. Moses was a murderer. David committed adultery and killed the guy and covered it up. Rahab was a prostitute. Peter denied Jesus three times. The apostle Paul was a Christian terrorist. Yes. But all these characters were called by God, used by him to do supernatural things. Yeah. God has put that call on all our lives to live out our faith, to fulfill the great commission, to be a witness for him. Yes. yes. To change who we are because we have come into an encounter with the living, risen Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. Amen. Amen. So whether you're a new believer or if you've been coming for decades, this is for you. Father, thank you that you work on our behalf. Yes, Lord. That you are perfect in all your ways, yes. that we are not. We come to you as very imperfect people who have not lived the lives that we should live. So we come before you with confidence knowing that you are not going to hold our sins against us. We are forgiven. We want to be like you. We want to represent you to this world. So conform us, please, into your image. In Jesus' name, amen.